cloud. Okay. Good evening and thank you for joining us for Visual Rhetoric. My name is Nick McConnell and I'm the Director of Operations for the York College Center for Community Engagement. Our presenter this evening is Ms. Ophelia Chambliss, artist in residence for Market View Arts. Ophelia has been successfully working as a fine artist with a number of distinguished solo and group exhibitions on her biography. Ophelia's academic background is communications with an emphasis on visual rhetoric and the power of the visual image to message in the public space. Ophelia maintains a studio at Market View Arts and functions in the role of artist in residence. Ophelia has a bachelor's in communication from Penn State University and combines her visual communication with verbal and written communication to tell the story behind her work. She has an MA in communications from Penn State with an emphasis on critical media discourse analysis. Ophelia's exhibition, Contiguous Two, opens at Market View Arts next Friday, April 2nd from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. and will be on display until Saturday, May 1st. And with that, I will hand the floor over to Ophelia. All right. So this is the last in our series. And I was just telling Nick earlier that this one is gonna be really incredibly interesting or not. But for me, it's one of the most interesting ones. So I'm going to share my screen and then talk to you about rhetoric. And it's for me, it's a tool that I use along with my artwork that helps us tell stories, helps us use images and representation. So here we go. So I use a lot of um, sometimes abstract graphics um, to talk about what an image means. I've done a series of pieces that help people understand complex concepts. So there's always something going on in the background of when you're understanding things. So this very first opening slide shows ethos, logos, and pathos. And in doing so, so these are representation of authority, logic, and empathy. And as you can see in the images, paying attention to like the red diangle, uh, diamond shape. So the first one is ethos. So we're talking about authority. So you imagine someone in a suit and then that represents a tie and a suit and a tie. And then the middle one representing logic. So you've got these two diamonds kind of balanced. So logic is a sense of, you know, this makes sense, that makes sense, and let's do the right thing in the middle. And then pathos, a sense of empathy. So just below the red diamond, you see the heart. So when we're talking about complex concepts, being able to do these kind of graphic images will help people understand what those concepts mean. So then I've found that when working with students, when you talk about ethos, logos, and pathos, now they go, oh, I get that one. That's the one with the heart. That's about empathy. Because now they understand it you know, away from its Greek definition. So I use a lot of this in a lot of my art. I use a lot of it in trying to put out messages. And I might do so then in a visual aesthetic way. So the idea of kairos. So that's when you take a proprietous moment for decision or action, like now is the time. So just like the one on the left, the abstract version of Kairos to where you have all of these objects kind of working together and the opportune and the right time is represented by the little blue shape in the middle. So I were to translate that into a visual image, you're looking at these fish that are swimming in different directions and again, you know, whether they're looking for feeding or is a, a migration or whatever the, the, the object is, that's a visual representation of what Kairos is. There's also very easy things that you can do um, with visual rhetoric. Um, this piece was, it's called Count It Twice. It's when organizations want to, you know, in, in, increase diversity and they might hire women of color and they would count them as like, oh, we have a new woman, a woman on board. Oh, now we also have a person of color on board. So very often, you know, they were false sense of diversity because they were actually counting those individuals twice. Um, this piece called delicate diversity. So there's lots of different things going on here. So we're talking about addressing the issue of diversity. And I use this kind of delicate cracked eggshell uh, technique to show that. And in addition to the cracked eggshell technique, I show these really large bodies 
that are balanced on these really tiny legs. So again, there's this other element of delicate balance and at any moment they can fall over. Like if they weren't standing right up against each other, you know, it's a very fragile state that they're in and they could very easily tip over. So I'm, I'm addressing the issue of fragility and delicacy in talking about or dealing with issues of diversity through the texture, through the nice soft pastel kind of Easter egg colors, through the fact that you've got the weight of these large bodies perched on top of these really tiny legs. So all of that symbolism and all of that thought goes into um, what that image represents. I also use it to um, talk about complex concepts and very often even mathematical terms. So this particular piece is called the Drake Equation. I'm a big sci-fi fan. I'm a big believer in math. I'm a big believer in the logic of numbers and, and computations. So the Drake Equation, which actually is a, an equation that changes all the time because what it does, it calculates the probability of life in outer space. And the factors, the numbers that are in here that are represented through these letters depends on our ability at space propulsion, our uh, technology in terms of how far we're able to send signal outs and, and bring signals back in, how far we're managing our own planet and atmosphere and environment. You know, maybe we take some steps backwards because of things that we're doing to our own planet. That would change the equation. Um, NASA is about to launch the um, James Webb Space Telescope. Is it, it might be this summer. This summer, it's being moved this summer. It's gonna be launched. It will not have first light when it actually, it cools off or warms up and they open it up for probably another six or so months. That's probably gonna change the equation as well. So it's really a lot of probabilities and factors that go into how the, the strength of something actually happened. So, you know, I use a lot of symbolism. I use the, the gray alien in the background. I use um, some movement and waves, crop circles, you know, strings, like, you know, talking about string theory. And again, you know, the, the N represents, you know, that's the probability N equals, and it's all this string of this equation. And I think the numbers and the equations are beautiful. I've also done the equation for uh, Schrodinger's cat, you know, the one that's based on the, the quantum mechanics or the theory equation where, you know, the cat in the box with the vial of poison um, is both alive and dead at the same time. And, it, and it's about, depends, it's about probability. But again, that equation, um, I think is actually beautiful. Um, I illustrate this by having these layers of these boxes, having the vials and an indication of the poison. I have this duality of the cat with this illustration. And if you look at the cats themselves, you know, one of them obviously with the X out eyes is probably dead and he has this little ghostly aura around him where the other one has the, the bright green eyes and, and he is most likely alive, but until we open the box, we don't know. So, and, and it's one of those things that can also be applied to lots of different problem solving um, scenarios. So, you know, until you try it, you don't know. It could be this, it could be successful, it could not be successful. For a long time, I worked with um, pastels and then trying to do this idea of dualism in images. Um, I worked with this guy, Samuel Akenya, who, you know, most art movements like cubism and Impressionism and pointillism were all kind of European based origins, where Samuel wanted to have the first American based um, origin of art style with dualism. I mean, I know we have pop art and things like that. So, with dualism, there's the idea of seeing more than one image within an image. So, this was one of my earlier pieces. So it's called the five vessels of knowledge. And when you look at it, you see these five vessels, you know, very ornately designed and textured. But if you were to turn the image upside down, you would see the faces of the ancestors that passed down the knowledge that's contained in these vessels. So I had a, a number of paintings that were uh, double wired so that you can hang them in any direction. Some of them you can hang horizontally. You could also hang them vertically. 
Um, this one could hang in both directions. I used to have it hanging in my living room and maybe every couple of years I would switch it around and, and, and turn it the other way. But I try to incorporate that in a lot of the pieces, you know, in terms of which direction do they hang from. And I even took to doing some things in kind of an overhead version so that, you know, the purchaser or the viewer could look at them or hang them in any direction. And I have a couple of those here, like this one. So this was from the Passion series. And it's kind of a voyeuristic overhead view of people doing things that they're passionate about. Um, this was the gardener. So the person who likes to work in their garden, uh, plant flowers, you know, tend to their lawn. Um, there was one that was the artist. There was someone baking in their kitchen. Um, there was someone sewing at a sewing machine. Um, I believe I had one. There was poker players. There was all sorts of things. But again, it was about people doing things that they are passionate about and then having someone kind of this overhead view. So a painting like this can hang vertically as it's shown here, but could also hang horizontally depending on which way uh, the person preferred. Depending on which way it was hanging, you could be the person that's doing the work outwardly or if you turn it completely up the other way, you could be facing the person that's doing this work. And then there are pieces like this um, where it, it's more complex in terms of the things that are going on in here. So this was about fair and equal housing, issues of redlining, diversity, um, easy access to housing, uh, racial diversity. So you'll see all kinds of symbols in here. There is a, I don't know if you can see my mouse, there's a scale for balance and equality there is this red line indication. Here is a melting pot, you know, with things springing from there. Here is kind of a, a color palette of complexions, equal housing, um, individuals in wheelchairs, uh, representation of multiple nations, um, you know, a representation of statistics in housing, access and availability, you know, the check marks. Oop. So, you can take all of these ideas and then combine them. And it's the sort of thing that when someone is looking at it, like, oh, I see that. Oh, I see, it. oh, I didn't see that before, you know? So they might not have seen the scale initially, but after spending a bit more time with it, you can see that, you know, the white picket fence, you know, the ideal of having a home in the neighborhood, um, having um, diverse mixes of families living, you know, within these spaces. So it was something that was meant to represent all of these things, but do so in um, an aesthetic way. And then this piece called New Day Dawning. Um, like most artists, we get, I don't wanna say we get stuck in, in themes, but there are things that are re repeated themes for us. Time is a repeated theme for me. Um, fish are, are, is a repeated theme for me for some reason. Um, so this one about time, so there's just this multiplication of these curves and these numbers, and you can almost hear the, the ticking of this thing moving. So I try to capture a lot of you know, that going on. Um, here is you know, the, the hand of a clock going up that direction, and there's another one over there. And again, all of that movement, and, and also my clocks tend to move counterclockwise as well. But I try to capture that movement in there. So it gives you that kind of cubist feel, but there's also a dawning. There's this, you know, this kind of awakening of, of sunrise in the process of that. But it's also involving people too. This one is called Peacock Queens. I did this piece and, and I, my plan was to just keep it because I liked it. I spent a lot of time on it. I worked out the logistics. I was at the time working on a series of playing cards and this one kind of came as an aside to it. And then in doing so, I was, and I was working on a project and I was working out some difficulties or issues or struggles. And then a friend of mine said, oh, I really like that painting and I really want to buy that painting. I said, okay, but first I need to tell you the story behind it. 
I said, because it's about me and you. And she's like, what? I said, yes. So I was working with her on this project and you know, we're two independent women who have ideas about how things should work. And, but we also had the same goal in mind, but we struggled, we had difficult because sometimes we did not agree. So we bumped heads a lot, but we always had the same goal and objective in mind. So when you look at this image, you see the two women, the goal, the goal that we had in mind was the staff. So we both have hold of it. We both have the same goal in mind and that's what that represents. Everything that we were doing, you know, it was backed up, you know, by love, oops. Um, so it was a shared mission, but we were just coming at it from two different directions. And so she did buy the piece and absolutely loved it even more when she realized um, what it was about and that it was us. And, and we're very, very good friends. And again, this is another one that has lots of different things going on inside. But again, you can see even in the type there, it's peace, justice, and equality. So you see the individual you know, with the kind of praying hands and representation of peace. You see the peace symbol. You see the scales of justice in the background. You see the representation of equality. I believe there's also a cross in the background. There's a heart in the lower right-hand corner. So being able to take all of those symbols, all of that representation and kind of combine it into something. So that someone's looking at this and they go, oh, that's kind of cool. But when you spend a little time with it and you allow your brain to kind of relax, you absorb some of that messaging like, oh, I see that. And even if you don't recognize or identify that you see it in the back of your head, you see some of those symbols and what's going on there. And then there are really simple pieces that look, you know, interesting. You know, you, I've got this kind of string, you know, holding on to all of these little things. But the, the idea behind it is it, this is really, it's called life. So the twig at the top, the little green twig, is a representation of us in our youth when we're first starting out. And then that string is wrapped around the fall leaf as we become more seasoned in, in our midlife and, and as we gain some experience. The, the more brittle um, twig, the brown one, then becomes us in our senior years, which is we're all still attached by this string because we're growing throughout all of this. The large rock is a representation of things that weigh us down, the things that have not always gone the, as they should in life, but then the small rock that's holding it all together that's weighing all of this down are the small things, the little things, um, you know, those who you've impacted, those who you loved, those who you've spent time with. So at the end of the day, it's just the little things that really matter. So all of that just, you know, to represent, you know, this is a lifespan and this is, you know, where we go, you know, we start here, this is where we end up. And at the end of the day, what matters are the small things. This one's here only because I just recently found it. I'd forgotten about it, but it was a fun piece. But I really wanted, um, I, I was trying to get the point of view. I wanted the viewer to be kind of down at the very front of it in the middle, just looking off into um, the horizon and then somewhat being somewhat surrounded by the water. Um, if I were to hang this, I would probably hang it up high enough so that the person really would feel like they're almost, um, not drowning, but they've got water up to their upper lip and, and they're immersed. So that's what I was trying to get with, the, with this. This is actually a self-portrait. Um, for me as an artist and maybe for other artists, you, know, you have to ask, you know, do the ideas that you have, are they truly, truly your idea? Which is what the one figure is. Um, on the left, or are your ideas and expression a part of saturation from just life, things that you're exposed to? Do I do these community engagement projects because that's what I wanna do from inside, or is it because the community that I'm exposed to requires me to do this? And then if you look even closer, there's a much larger figure in the background, you know, 
to say that is there even something greater than you know me as the artist me as how i'm exposed by community that guides me i'm always as an artist i'm in a lot of the projects i do always refer to the mission like this is what i'm supposed to do so i'm being guided by something even bigger than you know what the community needs and what i'm able to do because it's part of the mission so there's a bigger picture that i can't even see all of it yet but this is what i'm supposed to do And then there are pieces that become very interpretive. So on the right is disoi logoi. So that is a twofold argument, which considers each side of the argument, you know, in the hopes of coming to, you know, a deeper truth. And I had done these two pieces at completely different times. And then when I was going through images to put together for this, I was surprised at how similar they were. The one on the left called Safe Shelter was like an instant piece and inspired by one day I went to the dry cleaners and the young lady behind the counter had on sunglasses indoors, but I could see from the corner of the sunglasses that she had bruises on her face, like she had a black eye. And I could see that she had bruises on her arm and she really did not want to make eye contact with me. So she took my garments in and she gave me my receipt and before I left there, I said to her, I hope you press charges. And I felt like that's the only thing I could say to her because she was already incredibly embarrassed by all of this, but here she was working. And I didn't want to make it any um, more difficult for her. So my thought was, I, I was hoping she was in safe shelter. So, you know, this image, you know, with this conflict, this twofold, this kind of argument, you know, it kind of looks like maybe he's, protecting her or not. Um, but for her, and because of that um, experience, you know, this piece, Safe Shelter, came from that, that very brief interaction. Um, I already did the, the self-portrait. And then um, on the right is uh, an encomium. So an encomium is like a eulogy. It's like high praise. So in, in trying to help students understand what that is. So if you look at the orange and yellow pieces, if you think about that being people, the encomium is when you take one person and you raise them up above the rest. You know, you give them this kind of high praise. You would do that in a eulogy or some other sort of accommodation, but more so in something that really, you know, they're the center of, a, of attention. So that's by way of, of illustrating that piece. I do a lot with curves. Um, very often they're based on mathematical curves. Uh, my favorite curve is the Elysée Joux, which is a French curve that really has lots of little trifoils to it. It's just, they're just really fun, fun curves. And it's fun to kind of plot them out. So I do a lot of these abstractions based on these curves. Uh, Stasis is another favorite. Um, stasis being a period or a state of inactivity or equilibrium. Um, for me, stasis has always been about um, something that's stationary. You know, we're, we're, there's like this comfort level, we're here. But it's also a point about, like even a, in a, when you see it, compare it to the chess piece, the bishop over here, when you're contemplating your next move. So now we've gotten to a point where we're not in stalemate, but now I can make a move. Now we're negotiating. So for some people, stasis is a point of, okay, you've made your move. I've made my move. Now decisions are being made. Now we're going to see what's going to happen next. So it's that time in between that next move being made. And then you could take something, um, you know, so simple as uh, balancing rocks to talk about um, you know, the delicateness of a situation or how well things are weighted and how you are going to, um, you know, one, one wrong move will, will make this whole thing teeter. And I compared that to uh, the image on the right, the Jeremiah, which uh, basically is like a long mournful complaint or lamentation. It's a list of woes, but it's also a, a speaking style. Um, Frederick Douglass was one who did this uh, really well. 
he did it on the 5th of July, um, talking about the state of um, Negroes in America to be able to make that. So with a Jeremiah, you start off with, you know, well, you know, we were in this situation, things have been really tough. And, but, you know, we didn't have to be here. And there's this crescendo and it builds and builds and builds until you get to this point of impact. So that's my illustration of what a Jeremiah is. So you start off talking about, you know, on this day, you know, that we, we've had these circumstances, we, we're in this condition, but we're building, things are going to get better things. And then you have your impact to, to end with. And I, and I see it a little bit with the one on the left, because we've got this situation, we've got this thing, we've got this buildup, but if we move that one rock on the right, this thing, this whole thing could potentially kind of fall apart. But um, so there is a more realistic illustration of it. And then there is the, the abstract. So a lot of my abstracts are not just abstracts. There's a lot of meaning behind them. There's a lot of thinking uh, behind them and you know symbols behind them, representation or semiotics. And one of my other favorites is the seven circumstances. I'm not crazy about this particular uh, visual representation of the seven circumstances of persuasion, but I do like that it illustrates a sense of movement. You know, now we're now we're going somewhere. Now I've gotten your attention. Now we can start having this conversation or now you're starting to see where I'm going with it. And then the seven circumstances, you know, are probability. Could this happen? And then there's plausibility. Might it happen? You know, and then you want to persuade based on the importance of the issue. Uh, the proximity of time. Is this something that we can make happen now or needs to happen now? Um, it has to be relevant and have a connection to place. You know, we need to have this happen right now where we are because um, our, a relation to the person's concerned because we have all the right players in place. And then these right players are interested in the consequences of or the outcome of this. So all of these things, if all of these things are falling into place, this thing will start to move. So the idea or the concept that you want to bring across, now it has momentum. So that's partially why I think this works, but I might revisit this one. I still want to do something different with it that maybe you know some of these things have more strength than others or something, but it's not quite there yet. But I do like that it has the curves, it has the momentum. Um, right now they kind of all have equal weight, but you get the idea that now this thing is moving. And so that for that reason, it works. And then in this last one, so someone sent me something recently. So on the left is this painting I did recently and it's called Machete Mamas. And it's based on this photograph that I found. And it was also a follow-up to a conversation. I mean, there was something that happened to where this mother was defending her child against the police or some other situation. So it was about, you know, women in particular black women having to like, we need to defend our children. We need to protect them, save them in this world. This, we can't have this happen. And then just the other day, uh, Janine sent me this image on the right and it's real low resolution. So that somebody else took a very similar um, approach probably from the same reference photo. And then they wrote, so this is what they wrote about their piece. And it's called, Don't Let Them Take Your Fire. It says, this piece depicts a woman who has been forced by society to make a choice to bury her femininity in favor of strength in order to protect and lead this young girl through the hardships that, um, of life that are to come. Following behind her are the layers of women the young girl will embody between learning strength, vulnerability, wisdom, a woman must harbor many layers within herself. So I thought that was a very interesting interpretation, um, even though we both kind of pulled from the same reference image, but it's still about women protecting, you know, whether it be 
you know, their children. And, and I actually saw this as probably even her younger self, you know, how she's had to protect her younger self and all of these um, ghost images behind it being a representation of, you know, all of the things and the phases that she has gone through. And I love it when artists um, tell those stories behind their work, when they are able to articulate what it is they're thinking when they're creating the work so that, you know, as time will tell, they are able to, and people are able to understand and appreciate what their messaging or what their goal was behind the piece. Um, and, and I think that's extremely important. That's why I, I always encourage artists to, you know, study communication, you know, order to write down, talk to yourself while you're painting so that you get all of that backstory about why you're making the decisions that you're making and record them and then go back and write them. Because very often artists say, oh, you know, I, I don't know what I really meant. I was just doing this, but no, you weren't really just doing it. You put that there for a reason. Talk out loud, record it, and then listen to it later. And then you're like, oh, there is a method behind my madness. And I think that's real important. And especially when it comes to the art of African-Americans, because these are our stories, these are our legacies, because we don't have a lot of historic photographic images. And then um, through Jim Crow, we spent a lot of time with image representations that were extremely derogatory. So now to have artists of color re-embracing and being able to tell their story through these images, I think it's powerful. And I think that's extremely important. And I hope that in the future we have museums filled, filled with um, these stories and then the rhetoric and that is um, deeply embedded in these visual images. So that was my last slide. And I hope that you guys found um, some meaning in it all the way from the, the abstractions through the, um, you know, the abstract symbolism, all the way down to the, uh, the rhetorical content behind the messaging. And I thank you for, uh, for watching. Well, thank you so much, Phil. I really like that idea that, uh, that you had about uh, artists recording themselves. And actually, when you were, when you were talking about, you know, them talking to, talking to themselves through uh, that meaning, I was, uh, I was actually going to ask, you know, uh, about recording yourself, if you've ever done that. So you, you beat me to it there. <laughs> um, well, I want to, uh, I want to open up the, uh, the floor if, uh, if any of our guests have any uh, questions for Ophelia, feedback, thoughts about, uh, about the work um, and the, uh, um, the visual rhetoric theme. Hi, Shelby. Hello, hello. Um, well, first, Ophelia, you're amazing. Like, <laughs> you're, you're so amazing. Um, it's really cool and refreshing and enlightening to honestly be able to hear a lot of the inspiration behind your work because I've seen it and I've always known it's so much more and I know it's it's very intentional with everything you do so being able to kind of see that breakdown was very um inspiring as well um I did have a question it was it was one of the questions you kind of posed when you said how you know when an artist is creating something like is it because it's you know, their idea it was inspired or versus it because of like saturation. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know if you could kind of like expound on that a little bit more. Okay. So if like, even with the machete women, you know, so yeah, maybe I might've thought about, oh, I want to paint some black women, but what prompted me to do that? You know, was it something I saw in the news or on, on the media? So would I do that if I weren't inspired by that? You know, when I'm painting, so if I just want to paint pretty flowers, you know, that might be me just painting these pretty flowers, but I cannot go on just continually to paint pretty flowers because I am constantly being weighed upon by things I see in my social environment, you know, in my neighborhoods, in my communities, um, within the media. So I think it's hard for an artist not to be impacted. By that, you know, even the the photo series that you and Richard worked on, you know, the need to say, well, we need to get um, African Americans coming out in these suits and in these dresses and coming together. There was something that gave you a reason to do that, and that's saturation. That is the exposure to our 
environment and our uh, culture and existence. Okay. And would that go back into, because how they basically say how, you know, an artist's responsibility is to reflect the times. So when you see pieces like that, you know, okay, that was a piece made out of saturation because of. Absolutely. I'm sorry, I was writing down what you said. Saturation yeah. and exposure of what? Um, exposure to just environment and to circumstances. Yeah, I mean, I can paint flowers all day long, but I get, I mean, every time I do one of these projects, even contiguous, I say, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not doing this anymore. But something happens that tells me I have to do this because there's a need. There's a need or a, a story that needs to be told or something that needs to be corrected or an issue that needs to be addressed. And again, it's an artist's responsibility. And then I guess, oh yeah, I mean, no, I, I got plenty of questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I guess, um, how do you find that balance then of, you know, I, I think for me, being aware all the time, being socially conscious of what's going on around you, just how it's very um, taxing yes. and just exhausting, mm -hmm. but also... It's like, yeah, look at the flowers. I, I <laughs> the flowers. But then it's like the fear of, is this person even paying attention, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So as, it's like, how do you kind of balance, balance that? Yeah, I, I feel like I have three categories of work, well, maybe four. So I have, you know, the flowers because, oh, I want to get that little poofy thing there. Um, you know, I have the commissions that, you know, pay the bills, which are really cool. Um, and then I have my own work, the things that I just want to do. Um, and then there is the, the work that I am tasked to do because I am this human being in this body, in this world, in this place, in this time that I, that I also have to do as part of my own personal mission. So the, the work that I want to do is probably more the cubist things, the, the, the curves, the math, the things that I'm trying to, so it's probably more the academic me, the things that I feel like I have to do because I want to express these, these deeper concepts. I want to be able to have these deeper conversations, um, that things that I can you know, have these conversations at math conferences where I've spoken with using images. I recently did a presentation at a Illinois Highway and Transportation Authority with a bunch of engineers conference using art and talking about that sort of thing. So that's probably, more my me work is the cubism things. But so I have to, you know, take those four things and, and make sure I'm doing a little bit of all of them. Uh, right now, I feel like I'm overwhelmed with the community stuff because it's a lot of work and it is, it's exhausting because you feel like, am I really doing enough? And all this stuff that I'm doing, is it working? But then little things will happen. You know, like somebody will say something like, this is so important to me. I can't wait to bring my children here. I want my grandchildren to see this. And I feel like I'm part of this big collective. Then I'm like, well, hell now I gotta keep doing it, you know? So as so long as those things happen, yeah, I feel like there's, there's that job too. But I just try to make sure I do them all and I leave room for myself. And then like right now I've got this plan before the end of the year, I need to have a couple shows a body of work to take to a few shows at outer state galleries. So I have that plan for myself for my own work. Hmm. So it's time management. Hmm. Trying to think. <laughs> That's all I got for now. <laughs> hey, Eric, right. you got any questions? <laughs> All right. Well, if there is nothing else, then we will uh, wrap it up. And I want to thank uh, Shelby and Eric. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Emma had to uh, to head out uh, during the questions, but thank you all for joining us um, this evening. Again, uh, please stop by Mark Review Arts. 
um, beginning uh, next uh, next Friday um, for Ophelia's Contiguous Two exhibition. Um, really uh, looking forward to uh, to seeing you uh, stop by and visit the gallery. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Yep. Thank you so much. We can talk, Shelby. <laughs> I was about to say, we got to talk. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs>